All right, so uh, <clears throat> welcome back. We're going to start discussing in this video material from the third lecture of the second week, and uh, we're going to cover some ideas about thermal radiation. And when we're talking about thermal radiation, I have to give you a heads up. I haven't seen it hardly represented at all in any of the uh, exams and past papers I've seen. I've only encountered one question that appeared uh, twice out of all the questions that I solved for. So I'm only going to go through the principles of thermal radiation. We also are going to uh, cover the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and generally what are error sources in experiments. And we're also going to cover the Frank Hertz experiment, which is super important to understand. It is well represented in exams. And you can expect questions uh, of all sorts that relate to that subject. So let's start. Let's kick start. What is thermal radiation? And uh, generally what I want to do is, instead of just jumping into the physics, let's get an idea of what's going on. Now I have this block of iron. This is just this block of iron that I have. And I'm going to put some, uh, I'm going to put it over some flames here. These are my flames. And I'm going to heat it up. And it's going to emit a glow. It's going to start glowing. This glow is essentially electromagnetic radiation that this body, this iron body, is emitting. So this is electromagnetic radiation. And this electromagnetic radiation is a function of the temperature. So thermal radiation is a function, function of temperature. What's also important to understand is that it's independent of the material. When we're talking about thermal radiation, all you need to think about is the thermal part, the temperature part that is responsible for, the, for that specific electromagnetic radiation that we're talking about. And if, you can, uh, if you've seen the movie Predator, you might have seen that you can actually see this little human being that the predator was hunting that was emitting infrared radiation. Actually, all uh, living creatures emit that type of radiation that is detectable. Some creatures, like some uh, like types of snake, snakes can detect that uh, infrared radiation. So perfect. We have uh, a red glow or infrared radiation. And basically, what emits thermal radiation? Well, basically, all matter that is above absolute temperature, or rather, absolute zero, sorry. Absolute zero would be 200, let's see, 273, I believe, 0.15 Celsius, minus 300 and 273.15 Celsius. So if you're above this temperature, which is zero Kelvin, you will be emitting some sort of electromagnetic radiation. And why do we have this thermal radiation? It's due to the kinetic energy of the particles in the matter. So this is all I really wanted to touch on as far as, as thermal radiation. But I want you to, the, uh, the take home message here is, it's a function of temperature. It's independent of the material. And all material above zero, uh, absolute zero, emits some sort of uh, thermal radiation. And this is electromagnetic radiation. OK? Awesome. So this is uh, covering thermal radiation. And uh, we're, uh, we've arrived at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is a really, really cool principle. There's this scientist called Heisenberg. And he, uh, he observed and he theorized that if I have a particle here, let's say I have a particle here, this is my particle, and obviously particles have, well, it has a location, and it also has a momentum, which I'm just going to put here as mass, this is a weird M, mass times velocity. So this particle, if I'm examining it, I'm looking at it, I'm examining it using whatever, let's just say a microscope. And the further I am more aware, the, the more information I have about its location, the more certain I am about its location, the less certain I would be 
about its momentum. That means that these two properties that characterize my particle are inversely proportional as, to one another as far as my certainty level. This principle just dictates that we cannot know both qualities of this particle at a high, at a high level of certainty at the same time. That's all it means. And basically the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is the first Heisenberg uncertainty principle is the first of what we call the error sources. And these are just error sources in experiment um, determining a parameter. Doesn't really matter what parameter, but we can we cannot be certain as to all the qualities of the particle at any given time with uh, the same level of certainty. And this could cause an errors in our measurements. What else could cause an error? If the measurement itself if the measurement itself alters the result, alters the result or the examined system. And, and what would be an example for that? Because this is not very intuitive. When would that happen? Well, let's just say I have, oh, some sort of element here. This element may or may not have a current flow associated with it. So I want to measure that current flow with an ammeter. This is my ammeter. And my parameter is the current flow. The thing is that even if this element here is going to emit current, is going to have current associated with it, it's going to have current flow through the entire system, just by putting the ammeter in the electric circuit, I am adding resistance to it and that would restrict the current flow and I would get a measurement that is not uh, perfectly uh, ideal to, to uh, describing what is going on here just by adding this piece of material into my circuit. And that is uh, um, an indication of measurement that alters the system. Just by putting a measurement instrument in here, I am altering the experiment or altering the parameter that I'm measuring. And another error source is just the inaccuracy of our instruments. I can use inaccurate instruments. And instruments have been evolving, you can say, as far as physics, measurements, uh, instruments of uh, measuring different parameters have been evolving in physics throughout time. So we may not be using the most accurate uh, methods of measuring different parameters. So these are the three error sources. You just need to breeze through them. I wouldn't really memorize them. I wouldn't expect an open essay question about them. But this is just good to know. Now let's get to the important guts of this video, the Frank Hertz experiment. And again, this is an important experiment to understand. I've seen it well represented. And uh, again, some people find it kind of complicated, but if we break it down, it, you will see it is really, really easy. Perfect. So first of all, what I want to go through is this is what I am talking about in the presentation. It's important to me that you would know that this is the experiment I'm referring to. And this is the experiment that we're going to analyze. And I'm going to make it very, very simple. And I'm going to draw it from scratch because I find it easier that way to explain things. I have my tube. Inside my tube, I have my cathode. I'm going to liberate some electrons from that cathode. Now, as you see, we're doing it in the same orientation. Okay? So my cathode is negatively charged. This is my cathode. And I'm going to have my anode here. And note this, it is also negatively charged. Right before the anode, I'm going to have a grid here that grid is positively charged. So if I have an electron, it's going to accelerate towards that grid. And the voltage difference between the grid and the anode is 0 0.5 volts. And we'll get to why we're mentioning that. Now, in, uh, inside, inside this tube, I have mercury atoms, mercury gas to be more specific. 
It's just mercury gas atoms flowing around inside this tube. <clears throat> and I find it easier to explain the experiment and, and explain what we observed rather than go through the entire information of it. So let's start. We already know that if I apply a great voltage difference between the cathode and the, uh, and the grid here, I'm going to have a lot of energy to my electrons. And I can actually control the amount of energy. So let's say I have an electron that I'm accelerating through a voltage difference of two. That means that electron would have two electron volts. And we'd expect that electron to have that specific energy and it may be able, it may be able to interact and impart some of that energy to these atoms. Now we know that in order for an electron to be received here in the anode side, it needs to have at least 0 0.5 electron volts to be able to resist this repelling force. So let's, let's see what we have. We have this electron and it's liberated from the cathode with two electron volts. And what happens is it, it happens that even if it's coming into contact with this mercury atoms, it's bouncing off of them. It's bouncing off of them. It's not interacting with them. It's not imparting any energy and it gets to the grid with two electron volts, with the entire energy that it had. And now being that there's a negative to negative difference here, if an electron wants to go to a negative side, would have to invest this energy. So if I invest this energy, I have enough energy to get to the anode. And the anode would be 1.5 electron volts. And no energy was transferred to these guys. That's interesting. And why is that? Because I'm just going to give you the, uh, the uh, conclusion of the experiment so it'll be easier to understand. The, the uh, Frank Hertz experiment actually observed that in order to interact with these mercury atoms, you need to have a minimal amount of energy. That means that if I have just any amount of energy, I wouldn't necessarily be able to interact with these mercury atoms because the energy that needs the, en the interaction energy comes in a packet, these small packets of energy are also referred to as quantas, quantas. And if I have at least that specific quanta, I will be able to interact with mercury atoms and impart some of that energy. And being that we already gave one example, we know two electron volts is not enough, what is enough? What so happens to be that that quanta is 4.9 electron volts. That's the minimum energy, the minimal energy that could be imparted to these mercury atoms. Let's up the voltage to, let's say, 4.9 volts. That would mean I would have 4.9 electron volts. And we already know that this energy is the same amount of energy that I can use to interact. That's the basic quanta that is needed to interact with these atoms. So what would happen? I would have my electron here, right? The first atom it would interact with, it is going to impart all of its energy to it. So it's going to lose, lose 4.9 electron volts. It's going to lose 4.9 electron volts. It would have none left. That means that that electron transfers all that energy and the electron that is left could be ionized but and any other electron that will be left is just going to slowly drift towards this positive charge here and being that I don't have any energy being that I don't have any energy I can't invest 0 0.5 volts and I won't be able to overcome this negative to negative potential difference so the anode would read nothing this is going to be the reading zero that's interesting. You can you can notice you notice here that I had less energy here and more energy here, but the anode side here actually read 1.5 electron volts and here it didn't read anything. All right, let's take in another step forward. Let's just say I have eight volts difference. I would have eight electron volts. My electron would have eight electron volts. What would happen? Let's just say I bumped up to one of these guys. Being that I have more than the basic quanta required, I can interact with these 
this atom here, and I'm going to impart that quanta to it. And I can't impart any less than that quanta. I can impart this quanta multiplications to it, meaning that I can impart either 4.9 or 4.9 times 2, 4.9 times 3. This is basically what we're talking about when we're talking about quanta. So you can pretty much imagine what would happen here. I would lose some of the energy and I would have, let's see, I would have 3.1 electron volts, which is great, but what would happen next? I'm going to interact with another atom, but I don't have that minimal quanta now. So I'm really not going to be able to interact to impart any further energy. So I'm going to get to the positively charged grid with this charge, or rather with this energy. And I would be able to invest this amount of energy to overcome the negative to negative uh, ratio here. So I can take this down as well. All right. And as you can imagine, I would be left, I would be reading this amount of energy or this amount of current on the anode side. All right. So far, so good. And what we, what we really want to look at here is even though I'm, I'm steadily increasing the energy from 2 to 4.9 to 8, there isn't an increase in the voltage that is measured here. I got 1.5, then I got 0, then I got 2.6. Basically what this means, this experiment proves the quantized theory of interactions with these atoms. Let's take a look at the graph this graph. Let's take a look at it here and try and understand it. And it's a kind of important graph, but if we understood the experiment itself, we shouldn't have a problem. Actually, I'm just going to take it over. I'm going to take it over. It'll be easier for us to work with it over here. Uh, let's move it. Let's move it over here. Perfect. I'm just going to slap it here. All right, let's start working with it. What do we see? Well, first of all, let's make a point to understand the axes, the different axes here. This is the cathode grid voltage. Essentially, this is the amount of energy that I'm imparting to my electrons. All right? This is basically what it is. And this is the current measured. You can think of it as these numbers that we're reading on the anode end. So what happens is, I'm slowly increasing the charge, or rather, I'm slowly increasing, let's, uh, we're going through here, I'm slowly increasing the voltage difference, and I'm, in get, I'm getting increased reading in current, but then I'm getting a drop. And think of it at this point, this point, this is a 4.9 point. Meaning, I'm just going to switch colors here. This is a 4.9 point. This means that I'm going to read more current because I'm not going to be able to interact with these atoms. So I'm just going to reach the anode end with all my energy pretty much. And then as soon as I have one interaction with these atoms, I'm going to dramatically lose that energy and it's going to drop. But if I increase, I keep increasing it, like we imparted 8 electron volts, which you expect to be right here, you'd experience an increase. That means that if I impart 9 electron volts, it's also going to be increasing until I get to the multiplication, to the multiplication of this number here, and then I'm going to experience another drop. And this is basically what we're looking at. This is a proof of the quantized theory of interaction with specific atoms by these electrons. That's what we need to understand as far as the Frank Hertz experiment. And this is kind of key to understanding, sorry, to understanding that we can only interact with specific atoms via their specific quantas. And it's obviously material specific. We're talking about mercury here. And when we have other elements, they have their own respective quantas. And now that we understand the experiment and we know how to draw it and understand this graph, I would say we're good to go. See you in the next video.